Yeah. Everybody ready? We might have a phone call. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, June 8th. 2021 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Bolston. Present. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. Please stand for the pledge. Moving on to um, the agenda approval, um, if I may um, ask the commission to allow me to switch um, three and four, uh, just so we can have the presentation by uh, Ms. Berman, or, or I should say, um, our Senate, Senator Berman, so that we can make sure that uh, she's in and out quicker. Is that possible? Sure. Yes. Okay, very good. So um, with that, anything else that anybody would like to change on the agenda? No. Okay, so enter entertain a motion. Motion Just with to that approve one the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, so we are um, going to move for the um, presentation of, did we want to do uh, Senator Berman first or, okay, very good. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll roll backwards and do the other presentation before we move into um, the first, uh, the city manager selection. Okay, very good. So um, if Senator Berman is here, hi. Hi. Hello. Good to see you. Great to see you. Hi, everyone. Um, so the, uh, first, let me apologize for last month. I'm sorry there was some confusion, but I'm happy that I'm here today to give you my legislative report. As are we. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's so good to see all of you, mayor, vice mayor, all the council members. Great, happy to be with you today. Um, a couple things uh, about the, the Senate, the uh, session that we just had. So believe it or not, we did a $101 billion budget. Um, when I first started over 11 years ago, there, we were doing budgets in the $60 billion. So we've had a pretty significant increase. Um, when we went into this session, everybody thought that we were gonna really see a lot of cuts. Um, because remember, as we were going in, it was COVID and, and you know, our economy was having, you know, difficulty. Our sales tax revenues were down and slowly our sales tax revenue rose. And um, thanks to the American Recovery Act, the state got over $10 billion. So we ended up being fairly flush um, when we finished out the budget this year. And a lot of really good projects and um, a lot of money went to the environment, to purchasing environmentally sensitive lands, to um, cleaning up the Everglades. Um, I was really pleased about that. Um, money went for healthcare. We're doing something where we're covering new uh, mothers who have had a baby with, and who are entitled to Medicaid. They get a year's worth of coverage of health insurance and that's about $200 million. Um, we pretty well, we did a good job on funding our schools, a slight increase. I mean, I'd always, I always like to see more money for schools, but overall it was a good amount. We gave um, all of our first responders a $1,000 bonus for everything they've done for us for this last year. Um, we continued the raises that we've given to teachers. Um, so I'm very happy to say that I did vote for the budget. I thought it was a really good budget. Um, with that, I was really pleased and proud that we had two projects for Delray Beach that I brought in the budget, that we were successful in getting into the final budget. Um, one, a project for reading for $90,000 and one for the city water tank. I was very disturbed to see that they both ended up on the governor's veto list. Um, I wish the governor had called me and we could have talked about it beforehand. I didn't, we thought everything was good. Um, so we will go back next year. Let's, you know, continue to do projects and, and go on that route. Um, I always like to talk to you a little bit about the preemption that was done in Tallahassee so that you know where the state was. And I ha I'm very sad to tell you that this year was one of the 
greatest number of preemption bills I've ever seen, including a bill that actually preempted a vote that the voters of Key West took to um, prohibit large ships from sailing into their port. And in Tallahassee, it was preempted. So now large ships can sail into their port. And I'm a strong believer in home rule. I believe that the government closest to the people knows what they're doing. So I've been very disappointed in what happened. So a couple of them that um, may affect you is um, House, House Bill 403, which is home-based businesses. Right. Basically what it says is you cannot regulate a home-based business any differently than you regulate any other business in your community. So you can't have stricter parking rules, you can't have any stricter noise regulations because it's a business in a residential area. Um, this bill, I don't know if the governor signed it yet, it passed by the slimmest of majorities and there's a chance that he could veto it because it was so controversial. So, um, do you know if it's been signed yet, Matt? It has not been signed? Okay, so this is still a bill that you guys could maybe ask the governor to veto. Um, because I, I really think it's, it was a really controversial bill. Um, another bill that passed was regarding impact fees. And what it says is um, you cannot in increase your impact fees more than 25% over two years or 50% over four years. Um, another bill that passed that I was just talking to Commissioner Casal about had to do with design review elements, um, but because it says basically you can't uh, regulate design review elements from the city side, but there was a very big exemption put in because of um, a lot of the work of the people from Gulfstream, um, and, and I know Delray worked with them, and so you can put in design review elements if you already had an existing structure in place like a design review board. So that hopefully will, will make it so that it's possible. Um, other bills were passed about having to do with fuel retailers. So um, you can't require gas stations to have um, charging stations. You have to be careful where, if you wanna say where the gas station can be located. Um, they're gonna regulate, the state is gonna regulate that, not, not cities. Um, you as a county commission can no longer pass any laws saying we want our county to be energy efficient by 2030. You know, we want to be carbon neutral or whatever. Those, the, that's been preempted by the state. Um, on the good news side, on preemption, and which I'm sure most people here, we did not change the law regarding what they call the vacation rentals or Airbnb. So the laws that you have in place that protect you for, from having these people who you know have part, huge parties or do whatever are still in place. So that was the good news because um, that's a continual fight up in Tallahassee over that issue. Um, so uh, I'm so proud to represent all of you in the city um, and to work with, with the commissioners uh, uh, on a lot of different levels. And I, I'm really happy that Matt Forrest is here with us today. Um, Matt is with Ballard and he does a great job in Tallahassee. They work really hard and we work hand in hand with them to get our goals done. And I also have with me my legislative aide, Daniel De La Grange here. So that, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. May I just quickly ask uh, two things. First, I think we have some young people who are either on the verge of voting or voting, hard to say, ages with masks. Could you explain to them what home rule is and what the preemptive language is so they understand how important your vote is in the future? Sure, absolutely. So on different levels, on all different levels, it starts at the federal government. The federal government, when our constitution was prepared, says, these are things that the federal government has absolute control over, and these are things that the state has control over. In Tallahassee, we have a similar issue where we have certain things that we in the legislature have absolute control over, and then the, the localities, which is the home rule, so your cities and your counties, um, have control over those things. But in Tallahassee, we can actually pass laws where we say, you know what, we are taking control of these specific issues 
and you as a county or a city are not allowed to pass any laws, like I said, with the, with the energy efficiency. You can no longer say you want uh, Delray Beach to be carbon neutral by the year 2030. Now that is only going to be done on the state level. And right now we don't have any policy on the state level, which is why a lot of times the counties and cities step in because they're filling the gap where the, where the state has not addressed the issues, but now we're prohibiting the state from addressing the issues, and that's the preemption as we take over the control. Thanks for clarifying, and they might be interested to know that at one point in time, Key West wanted to ban an ingredient in um, sunblock because it was determined that that particular ingredient was killing the coral reefs, and we all understand the long-term value of the coral reefs, but... Um, the uh, Key West was not allowed to do that. And so this is why it's very important that you know who your representatives are and you vote. Um, and one other thing that people might be interested in, because you and I had discussed this before, is Bright Futures. Sure. Changes are coming to Bright Futures that are a little concerning. Sure. So there, and, and actually, that's an amazing example of citizen activism, the bill on Bright Futures this year. So there was a bill introduced this year that said that um, bright futures would only go to students who took certain majors. And it, most of those majors were gonna be in the science, technology, and engineering, the STEM fields. Um, and if and the reason the, the the and I didn't agree with it at all, but the legislators legislature's reasoning was um, we only want to give it to people who are going to be able to get out and get a job. Now, I, I was a liberal arts major, and I majored in international relations, and so I probably wouldn't have qualified for bright futures under that kind of criteria. A lot of people who major in liberal arts go on to do all sorts of things. So um, the students got wind of it, and they heard about it, and I can't, we got thousands of emails. I, it was great. People were like, this is absurd. How can you be doing this to us? Why why are you changing this? And, and people had, you know, as students, you plan ahead. You know, okay, I'm gonna, if I do this and I do that, I'm gonna get bright futures. I'm gonna be able to come to Florida. I'll get my education paid for. And, and we were basically taking away that contract that we had with all of you. Um, and the students were, came to Tallahassee and had their voices heard, and it was totally gutted, that bill. It passed in a very, very totally different form. Now all it says is there has to be a dashboard that will tell you um, these majors could lead to these jobs. And that's all that that's all that there is right now is this dashboard and and everything else with bright futures stays the same so that was a great example of, of how citizen activism got changes that's made in tallahassee thank you so much and thank you for your time here today of course anyone else yes. thank you uh, senator berman for coming i waited until now to get excited and i didn't even know that you were on the um, i knew that you were coming so i'm so excited that you're finally here i wanted to have everyone know how difficult it has been to fight for home rule that we've only had since 1965 and yeah. ever since the state has been clawing back everything they can get their hands on so that you have no control over a lot of things and the more they get the more they won't want and the biggest thing to me is our Airbnb uh, lobbies, lobbyist that uh, we've had to fight because you might have a quiet neighborhood, someone wants to use their home as a an Airbnb facility, you don't know anything about it, but all of a sudden there are parties at 2 and 3 in the morning and we have some code, but that's about all they've allowed us to do. We can say, once we find out that it's an Airbnb, and they don't really even have to tell us if unless there's some outward sign that people are coming and going on a regular basis. We couldn't say how often the property could be in Airbnb, um, all kinds of things. And so there's a huge lobby effort at the state level that's been trying to shut the cities and the towns down. And Delray Beach is one of many because we're close to a, a university. 
and anytime if you're if the properties are near universities they have lately been party houses that anybody can rent and have a party and too bad for you if you live next to one but I would like to commend our um, our representative Mr. Mike Caruso who was the deciding vote I think they felt that he was not going to vote their way and that he was going to say no we're not going to do what you want to do and so they um, they table the bill for this year but they'll be back as they have every year so if you are interested in being in charge of your government and how we here decide what happens to you on a local level I encourage you to stay tuned listen if you can is I think they broadcast some things we do. We do. and just be aware and whether you vote or not, you can always call your local representative, your Senator Berman, and say, I don't want that. Who do I call? What do I do? So become active, because we might not be up here one day. They might just outlaw us. And I think <laughs> one thing that was on the governor's desk to sign was if someone should decide that they want to not continue as a city commissioner, and wish to resign in order to run for another office, mm -hmm. that the governor is now going to appoint who sits up here. So if that's not something that's just frightening, uh, I don't know what is. So stay tuned. Um, it's going to take the young people, I believe, to be actively involved because once they figure out that you're not going to vote for them, they might start listening to us a little bit more. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Do you have anything? No. no? Okay. Um, I want to say thank you very much for coming in and giving us this update. Um, I agree with both of my um, colleagues in, in what they're saying and, and how important it is um, to, um, you know, to the young folks that are here. You guys can make all the difference in the world. If every one of the young folks went out there and voted, um, trust me, um, we would actually see the needle move. That's how big of a, a voice that you have that is not being used currently. So it's really important to understand uh, your power. Um, people don't realize that, but you do have power. And in numbers, it's it's amazing. But most of the time, the young people don't get out and vote. And, um, and you know, unfortunately, it affects how your quality of life is going to happen in your local government. I have a question for the senator, however. Um, in the way that we are being um, preempted from the state level, is there any um, means by which to preempt uh, the state by the federal level? There, there is absolutely. Um, you know, it's funny because when the when we get this federal preemption, everybody screams and yells, and holla, and that, but then it's okay when we can turn around and do it to the cities and counties. So um, it's pretty hypocritical. But yeah, the, there's there's areas for sure. I mean, the Voting Rights Act, which is now before Congress. As many of you know, we passed a voting law this year in Tallahassee that I voted against that um, makes it harder for people to vote. It says that you can, instead of having getting an absentee ballot for four years, now you only get it for two years. Um, it says that no one else can pick up your absentee ballot. You have to pretty much turn it in yourself. And we have a lot of elderly who need help getting their absentee ballots in. Um, it's got a lot of really bad things in it, and, and that could easily be preempted by the federal government if they would pass another their own version of a Voting Rights Act. So, yes, there are things that the federal government can do to limit the states, but it's, it's a war right now, and you guys um, were in the firing squad this year, unfortunately, I would say, you know, and let's hope that it calms down for the future because it was a really tough year. Uh, a lot of votes, so many votes. I mean, I, I sent you guys a letter. I gave you like a little snippet of where the preemption took place. I think there were probably 10 or 15 bills where preemption took place this year. It would seem that it would be, um, I would like to support some of the federal level uh, to <laughs> preempt the preemptions, if you understand what I'm saying. I do, you know, I do. I, I agree with you, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for having me. And, and just a little plug, um, Commissioner um, Johnson and I do a uh, racial justice panel. And yes, um, if you ever want to come and listen to it, it's, it's a great program. And I'm so proud to have her up as part of the panel. So. Thank you so much for coming, and thank My you uh, for what you had to um, bring to the table for us. And certainly it was great for the, the those that showed up to really understand how important it is on all levels of government, local, state, and federal level. 
And um, at this point, if you want to come up and give us a little bit of a um, you know, some, any, any updates uh, as well, Matt, you're more than welcome. So sure. thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Matt Forrest with Ballard Partners representing the city of Delray Beach. It's an honor to be back and for you again. Um, uh, the COVID pandemic uh, was definitely a, a barrier. Uh, I live right up the road from you guys in West Palm Beach, and uh, I could have been miles and miles more away because it didn't matter. A lot of Zoom meetings uh, were held. But I wanted to give you guys some perspective and some stats and some, some information the, not to necessarily rehash exactly what the senators went over, but to give you guys also some bigger perspective on, on where things are. And also, hate to say it, how quickly we are quickly approaching the next session. So big picture wise, I think it's important to know that we just wrapped up in Tallahassee uh, five weeks ago was when the session concluded. And then there was a special session on gaming wrapped about three weeks ago. And unfortunately, the next session is not a year away. I always try to educate people on this because they go, oh, we're done for this year. What are we going to do next year? What are we going to do next year? The next session starts in 216 days. It starts in January. Mm -hmm. And the committee weeks will start before that. The committee weeks have actually already been now announced. They start in September. They are 103 days away from when they will start meeting again in Tallahassee. Different than this past year, where it was right after an election, the, there's no election between now and the next session. So the members, there's no education time period. Uh, I use the metaphor, they already know where their lockers are. They know where their classes are. This is really not a second session. It is really the second half of one session. Mm -hmm. So we have a very short break here in the summer to kind of regroup, see where things are. And then when the legislators go back to Tallahassee, they're gonna hit the ground running. Bills are gonna start getting filed in September. They're gonna get start being heard in committee in September and October and November. They'll take a little break around uh, December uh, for the holidays. And then the session goes back into January. So from where we stand here right now, a year from now, another session will already be done and it'll be two months in the past. So it's really a, a, a regrouping as we go into the next part. Big picture wise, as the Senator said, there was a lot of preemption bills this year. Uh, no doubt, um, not a great year when it comes to a full local government legislative agenda. However, dive into the actual bills and you have amazing staff that I talk with often with with Jennifer and with Jason and and really diving into the, actually what the bills say and not just what the headlines say because as much as a lot of the bills are preemptions they they get watered down throughout the process without a doubt bad bills I wish they all went away at the same time usually not nearly as bad by the time you get to the finish line as when they started for example the impact fee bill that the governor just signed yesterday um, limits your ability to raise impact fees by more than 25 percent every every two years there is a procedure for extenuating circumstances that you can raise them more it requires more hoops to jump through requires additional studies but when that bill was filed there was no uh, ability to do it under extenuating circumstances and more importantly the percentage was three percent it limited you to three percent so again don't get me wrong we wish the bill you know never made it across the line at the same time this is what you're up there lobbying and advocating for um, i talk to your staff constantly throughout the year where's jason there he is. Uh, I, 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 I'm afraid to say, if, if you looked at my text messages, my, he's probably first above my wife in terms of text messaging and phone calls from, from the city of Delray Beach uh, to really dive into the weeds on things. Um, big picture wise, also on your budget issues. I was really happy this year. You guys, uh, with the work of your staff, we filed five budget requests up in Tallahassee. So five and, and, and turning in a budget request is, is not a cocktail napkin idea. It requires a lot of information from your staff, a lot of data, a lot of work to fill out these applications so we can go to Tallahassee and see what will get traction. I, I use the metaphor of it's going to the plate and taking a swing. We went to the bat five times up to the plate. We got two hits this year. Out of those five that we turned in, two of them not only landed in the budget one way or the other, worked their way through the entire process, survived the budget negotiations and budget conferencing, made it into the final budget. I call that a triple. So out of five times at the plate, we got two triples. Unfortunately, we were thrown out at the plate, out completely. So of course, yeah, no run, it stinks. At the same time, you were right there on the edge and this is the nature of the legislative process. You gotta keep going up there and keep making those asks. Also, do not feel persecuted. It's really hard. It's really hard not to take a veto personal. At the same time, you weren't singled out. 142 projects were vetoed out of the entire budget. You have two. 35 in the education silo alone, where you had one. 21, not just projects in the entire budget area, 21 other projects in the huge list, about 40 other projects in water projects. Out of those, 21 got vetoed. So a lot of it is simply also 
didn't quite meet the criteria. And also at the same time, things got to, you know, they're going to thin things down. And eventually, sometimes you're, you're on that chopping block, sometimes you're not. At the same time, it's very frustrating. Um, the senator and I uh, are extremely frustrated because we know how much effort and time and phone calls and uh, dialogue goes into this type of session. And at the end, it goes very quickly. Uh, the governor got the, the budget on, uh, I believe, uh, an afternoon, and the veto list came out the next morning. So <laughs> you didn't even have a chance to go, hey, it's, it's on your plate. Make sure you, oh, it's done. Okay. So that's the thing. You also just stay engaged the entire time. This is no different for the city of Delray Beach. Uh, I know a lot of commissioners are nodding. We've been here many times before. We've brought home projects before. We've had things vetoed before. We've also had years where we couldn't even, you know, we, it was tough to pull together a project to even get it selected. So I would say your, the team is working very well. Five ideas up there. I think we regroup and retool throughout the, su the summer here for the next couple of months. Maybe rethink what projects are important to you. Um, and then we go to Tallahassee with another robust, comprehensive agenda. The thing to remember when going up and asking for money is very simple. What would you fund? If it's not important to you in Delray Beach, why would it be important to the people of Pensacola? Because that's basically what we're asking. We're asking them to use state dollars collected from around the state and give them to Delray Beach specifically. So you look at projects that are going to impact the citizenry of Delray Beach and beyond, whether it's a statewide or regional impact, and then what's a priority to you? If you have zero dollars in your budget for it, probably doesn't show a lot of priority to the city of Delray Beach, and therefore it's hard to go to the state and say, hey, we really would like money for this. So keep those things in mind. We would be, I'll be working with your staff to come up with our appropriation ideas. The deadlines have not been uh, posted yet as to when we'll need ideas, but I would imagine September, October, we'd want to hit the ground running so I can go see my good friend, Senator Berman, and say, here's some ideas from Delray Beach. Before I dive into the legislation, that is a great segue. I wanted to really stress just how, uh, um, lucky you are to have a delegation uh, represented the way you do. Uh, Representative Caruso, Representative Hardy, and Senator Berman um, are fantastic when it comes to what does the city of Delray Beach need and want. Um, I've, I've worked with you guys for several years, and I've worked with Senator Berman even longer when she was in the House. And this year, that relationship was critical. Mm -hmm. the, set, the COVID pandemic shut down the Capitol. The Senate was closed for business. You had to do everything virtually. The fact that not only do I know Senator Berman well, and we had access right away, but her great staff between Daniel and Abby, um, it, it, it's a two-way street. It's not only me getting to them and saying, hey, this is an important issue, Del Rey. They would call me up. Hey, there's a bill up. What does Del Rey think about it? And so that kind of relationship and dynamic is important for your, for your delegation members. And you guys are very well represented on both sides of the aisle and in the House and the Senate with that. This is a horrible setting to dive into bills. Um, you have many other things to get to, and I would be here for hours diving into the nuances of all the different legislation that passed. I uh, am available. Again, take advantage of the fact that I live right up the road. Um, I can come meet with you individually and talk about any of the bills. In addition to what the Senator Berman uh, provided, um, I provide also a, 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 what I call a comprehensive report. At the same time, I try to thin it down. I think even my thinned down version is about 25 pages. So feel free to dive into that part. Um, and then we can talk individually about certain bills. Um, two that I'd like to highlight, um, one, vacation rental, as you brought up, did die this year. But most importantly, as a guy on the front lines of this fight for you guys for years now, I saw a little shift this year. For the first time ever, legislation an amendment uh, was filed in the Senate to the vacation rental bill that the cities supported, that the cities endorsed. It basically removed the full preemption and, and put in a regulatory environment at the state level. So it was really a... If you look at the big battle, the big war, it was a, oh, wait a minute, there's a pathway here that could get to um, state regulation of the, of the platforms with local oversight, which would be the win-win scenario. Of course, it didn't go anywhere in the House, and the bill died quickly then in the Senate. But as a guy that's been doing this now for several years, and you're fighting, you know, you're on defense the entire time, it was, it was a, a glimmer of, a, a, hey, there's hope here. There's possibility here. So I do think that issue will be back again next year. Um, and hopefully they pick the flag up from where it stopped there in the Senate and go forward from there. Um, the other part is one bright spot, one positive bill, a legal notices bill that was passed, HB 35, and it has been signed, I believe, already now by the governor. It changes the way local governments um, are required to notice uh, certain um, either ordinances, um, legal notices that you have to file in the newspaper traditionally. 
Obviously, I'm sure you guys that do the budget, you'll notice there's probably a large, I would say minimum six figure, maybe seven figure, seven figure uh, line item in your budget for legal notices. This bill doesn't completely wipe that away, but it gives you new options. There's options for you to put things on a public website and as, long as you notarize, as long as you notice those differently, it gives you other abilities. So there was some positive move on an issue that again, I've seen that one around for years mm -hmm. and it finally made it across the line. So again, um, out of the session, don't read the headlines, read the bills. You have excellent staff and I know they will just dive into the legislation and figure out how they may need to tweak or update some of your ordinances. But at the end of the day, I think the city of Delray Beach and the residents of Delray Beach will still fare just fine in this wonderful city. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for a great report as well. Um, I just wanted to also mention so that everybody understands, Matt is our lobbyist who works for Ballard and Partners. And um, what we do as a city is we pay Matt for his services to be the liaison between the city asking for money and uh, different things um, on the state level. So Matt actually works as our liaison um, and tries to get us money. And sometimes he comes in with a lot. Other times we kind of like swing and miss, and that's understood, but that that is how it works. And again, just like Matt said, the more that you can get up to bat, uh, the more opportunities you have of being able to bring in money. And what that means is that it's money that we're usually spending already. It's just that now we're using state dollars to use uh, to, to do that, which frees up more local dollars for other things like parks and different things that we're doing locally. So that's why we go for that. I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood because I never understood what a lobbyist was and what their function was until I, I got into government. So now you guys are, well, you know, you, you understand it. So anyone else uh, for making? Yes, yeah, sure. Just out of curiosity with respect to uh, HB 35, when considering a land use or zoning amendment, does that change the requirements for um, notice within proximity of the property? I'll have to tell you, I'm not a, a, an expert on down to the nuances of the exact bill, okay. but I would I would highlight that and go look at HB 35 no, and have your staff do it. I just know exactly. off the top of your head. Thank yeah, you. I'm sorry. Yep. Good. Anyone else? Yes. I, I would just like to like to say th thank you um, for your perspective today, because we were in our goal setting meeting when we got the word about mm -hmm. the you know the the two uh, vetoed items, and uh, it was really it was really disappointing. And this is you know, funds are funds. You know, mm -hmm. no matter no, no matter what, and um, you know, to have our, our staff put five across, I know that was a lot of work, and you guys walked me through what that takes. And you're right, it, it, it's not a note on a napkin. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I think to get two all the way across into the budget was incredible, even, even if it did end the way you know it did. So I'm looking really forward to being as proactive as possible and starting right again. Like you said, it's right around the corner. Um, and, I, and I'll just mention that I think it, it really does help to have that, those relationships and those conversations. And Ms. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, Vice Commissioner Johnson, you brought up you know, the topic um, in regards to Airbnb. You know, Airbnb and um, you know, I had a conversation with a lot of representatives that were on, you know, were on the fence and they need a perspective. They need to understand our communities just got done fighting a sober home crisis that were tearing our communities apart. Um, and now we're dealing with these vacation homes. And the less families we have living in homes, the less kids that go to our school. I mean, there's a real trickle-down effect mm -hmm. of how it hurts our communities and then therefore hurts our cities. And they really didn't see it from that perspective because remember, a lot of those representatives that are voting on this, they may not know Delray Beach. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really, I, I found value. For the first year, I really felt value in those conversations and how important they are. And uh, we'll be as proactive as possible next year. So. Great. Thank you. And just real briefly, uh, it's very, very important what um, uh, Commissioner Boylston just said. Um, you know, the people that are making the decisions don't live locally. They don't live here. They live everywhere across the country, I mean, across the state, and they don't have the same issues that we have. So they don't really kind of think that it's a big deal. And so a lot of times they pass something blanket-wise that affects us in a very major way that doesn't affect other areas. So it's really important to understand how, how important it is to have your representatives make Make sure that you're they're saying the right things can I ask another question of, of you Matt um, what can we do to be more successful in um, is there something that happened this year that uh, would would lend itself to next year's uh, attempts to get funding for one or another project like what were the winning projects and did we miss a mark like not putting something in that we might have or is it more that and then the second question I had was, if we combined, because you said something that was really kind of um, poignant to me, 
if we combined um, a certain project that is not just us, but let's say um, some coastal towns, and we went in together, mm-hmm. would that increase our ability to be able to get uh, something back? Because we're now saying it's not just us, but we've got on a seawall issues going up and down uh, the eastern seaboard, and therefore here's nine you know cities that have banded together and put in something. Would that help us? It's funny you bring that up. I've, I got that question earlier, like a week ago, and I've been, I've been a lobbyist since 2007. I went in because there'd be no math. What is that? Almost 14 years, I guess. And uh, I've never gotten that question before. Now twice in a week. So maybe it's just, it's just trending. To answer your first question, what can you do better? I honestly would tell you, keep doing everything you're doing. You have a engaged staff that uh, talk to me often mm-hmm. and throughout the session um, uh, that also realize you have to be more nuanced with your argument than just, it's an attack on home rule. My meetings go really short if I walk in and go, I'm against your bill, why? Because it's an attack on home rule. They go, okay, got it. And I go, all right, well, thanks for your time. You know, it's, it's short. So f- what you guys are able to do and what Jason does a great job and, and Jennifer um, is giving me the nuances that I can go work with it. For example, on the building design bill, um, when it first started again, it preempted all building design issues. And then it was um, platted or uh, units in a PUD were exempted and things and we kept going through it and I kept going to the Jason are we there yet are you guys covered yet are you covered yet and eventually got down to they're gonna put architecture review boards that are in place by I think January 1 and he goes we're so close you gotta get rid of that date I'm like, huh. so now I go back to the sponsor do I take credit or with these single people no but like anything it's if there's 12 of you that are saying get rid of that date get rid of this date it's going to help and so it's that kind of nuance throughout that that your staff keep getting my calls and keep giving me the updates so i would say from staff and from your engagement standpoint you're doing everything right and and just like your commissioner said stay engaged throughout the more they hear back from the legislators throughout the process what their other elected officials do are the big issues this session um uh, i i assume uh, the capitol's back open again so i assume palm beach county day will be back in place mm-hmm. So early January, I mean, if you want to plan a day to Tall- Tallahassee, that never hurts. So I would say um, keep doing what you're doing is would be my recommendation. Um, I'm not an advertising guy, but I'm pretty sure what we do is exactly the same as advertising. Consistent, steady messaging done over time. Just because it didn't land this first time, you, you don't just throw it out. You just keep doing what you're doing and, and eventually it will pay off. With what you, in regards to a group project, the... The nuance with that is the funding part of it. It's the, when, you, when you put an item in the budget, it has to go to a legally recognized entity. So um, because of not only because of where's the money going, uh, but also accountability. Mm-hmm. They're eventually going to want to be able to say, who, where's the money going and, and, and how are they spending it? So it gets a little complicated when you talk about multi-jurisdictions. You know, is the money going to you or the, the adjacent town and who's responsible at the end? And, but I do think... You could get creative if you said, look, we have a project and they've agreed and we have an interlocal agreement and things like that. As long as you know, at the end of the day, it's going to be one name in the budget. But yeah, the, 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 the pitch and the scope uh, would, would definitely help the project. I, we have a regional group um, that is um, involved in uh, you know, sustainability and, and whatnot. And I don't even know if that's kind of the route that we could potentially take. But I'm just trying to increase our, you know, our opportunities and also address some of the pending issues that are, you know, kind of sizable coming in in our direction. So anyway, it's just something to kind of think in mind because I think that if that has never been done before, yeah. maybe that's how we kind of, uh, and we also should have maybe even a coalition down in the southeastern area where we all help each other. Um, yeah, would be, that would be, I think, really, uh, you know, s- strong and supportive. I mean, maybe it won't necessarily directly affect us, but if we're helping someone else and then they help us with their letters saying that we don't want that date or whatever mm-hmm. it is, that could actually be very strong as well, coming sure. in with a lot more um, you know, power. Yeah, the um, more you roll in the same direction, the better. The last thing I did want to mention, and you, you asked it, it, out of your projects, mm-hmm. it's really, it, it, it's, it's very obvious. Out of the five projects that we submitted, um, three had matching funds. Mm-hmm. Two did not. The two that did not, we, we couldn't get any traction for whatsoever. Of the three that had matching funds, two of those landed. Forward. So I think, again, if it's not a priority to you, it's not a priority to Tallahassee. Right. That's a, a, a huge red flag right then. But then out of that, I think you really did a great job, and this is, again, working with your staff, is you, you cover what I call the blocking and tackling. You know, I got, sorry, a lot of sports metaphors. I apologize. <laughs> but you have a water project. You have a park project. You have an education project. You have a mental health project. 
You know, you're, mm -hmm. you know, when you turn in four water projects, they're going to go, Matt, great, pick one. <laughs> Senator Berman, you got three projects for one city here, pick one. I mean, this is the kind of behind the closed door meeting it happens. So it's nice to go, you have spread across the board. And so that, I think that's another good way to be successful as well. Very good. Vice Mayor, did you have yes. something to add? Yes. Uh, a few years back, guns seemed to be a big issue wherein we were advocating for weapon assault weapons to be banned. I didn't hear one thing come out of this session this year. Was there not any, and I don't want you to spend a lot of time with yeah, it. I don't recall any firearm legislation, was there? Was. there, was? there was? Unfortunately, and of course it was the opposite direction. So there was one bill that said that you can bring a gun into churches now if they have a school on the property. Um, so um, we have not, we have gone the opposite direction, unfortunately. Um, and I'm sorry to report that, but we've had, you know, after Parkland, we had some positive legislation about gun safety issues um, with the red flag law and with um, bump stocks. Um, but since that time, we have not had any. So. And I did want to say about the, um, you asked about the coastal projects and things like that. There's a lot of grant money mm -hmm. in the budget for resiliency. So please make sure you guys are aware of that and, and apply for those grants because they're for the city. They're septic to sewer money. There's a, a lot of different projects. So very good. I know you guys can take advantage. Good. Thank you. Anything Thank else? you very much. Thank you both so very much. Thank Thanks for coming. Okay, moving on to our second presentation, which is going to be um, the, the um, Employee of the Month. Yay. Yay. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commission. I am so excited to be here as usual. Mm -hmm. I am Lachey King, the Human Resources Generalist. And I have the awesome job of being able to present the City of Delray Beach Employee of the Month. And this month, the employee is Azim Hoysen. Unfortunately, he's unable to be here, but if I can, I'd like to read what was submitted. Please do. Okay. Azim has went above and beyond to help the patrons in the community, as well as the facility at Pompey Park. When the athletic affairs and offices and game rooms at Pompey Park experienced damage because of leaks, Azim installed and laid down tile in both areas saving the city labor costs that would have went to a contra contracted vendor. He has also enhanced the city's image by helping two senior citizens who were experiencing car trouble. Azim helped change a tire for one senior and replaced a battery for another, both after his scheduled shift. Azim is an, an outstanding employee and deserves recognition. So I think this is awesome. And because of that, Azim will receive this plaque. Right. And also eight hours off with pay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lachey. And congratulations to Azim. OK, moving um, backwards, uh, which is the um, city manager selection. That's uh, agenda item three. We're going to go ahead and go there. And this is Dwayne DeAndrea. Good evening, Mayor Commissioners. Dwayne DeAndre, Human Resources Department, for the record. As you know, um, the past two days, we've had our final finalist for city manager candidates here on campus. Um, we had them meet with the department heads and um, have uh, citizen involvement and interviews with you as well and then interviews from the dais today mm -hmm. um, after that um, what we'd like to do is um, obviously for your consideration is uh, the discussion and selection of possibly a city manager here this evening so what I have done um, whenever you're ready is, is um, created a ballot um, with each one of the city manager candidate finalist name on it Michael Bornstein Terrence Moore and Leonard Sossaman mm -hmm. And then I would like to distribute those to you whenever you're ready. Have you rank them one, two, and three? Have the clerk um, have the clerk tally them, and then give it up for your consideration. Okay. And um, when would you recommend that we have discussion before or after that? I would re recommend now before. Okay. 
All right. So to the to the commission. Well, well I just wanted to make a statement, um, and, and we talked about this earlier uh, in regards to the process. Um, and I think it was a very successful process, and that has a lot to do with Duane and your, and your team, obviously. Um, we had over 100 applicants. Mm -hmm. We were presented with eight highly qualified candidates, and I think that's important because there were plenty of qualified candidates. We had eight highly qualified candidates to select from. And I look at our three finalists, all of which have decades of experience being a city manager, all have extensive experience with large capital projects from water treatment facilities to city halls to airports to police stations. All have coastal community experience and that's not easy to find. There's only so many of us. Um, and all bring a history of stability. Each one has had long tenures in multiple cities, each one. All three of our finalists have checked all of those boxes and, uh, and I think it's important with the public here um, that I commend you and your team for going out and, uh, and securing these individuals for us. And I look forward to a conversation in regards to which one will be joining our team. Absolutely. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. no comments. comments? Do you have any? Yes, no, we're going to do a, um, a, you know, a, a ballot so you can have the the motion will follow that, unless unless the commission is interested in doing it differently. Didn't we do that last time? Yes. The way you're uh, uh, operating. Yes. Okay. I think it's a lot. E it's a lot easier to know where we're at as a team, and then we could discuss more than. Yeah, that. exactly. So let's go ahead and take the ballots then, if nobody has anything else to. So please be sure that you write your last name on your ballot. Put your last name on the ballot. Oh, okay. Thank you. And are we ranking this one, two, and three, or how is it? Okay. Thank you. Okay, Madam Mayor and Commissioners, we have a unanimous vote for Terrence Moore, 5-0. Okay, is there any uh, further discussion? So the, the only comment I would like to, like to make is, again, we had three great finalists, um, but I leaned heavily this round on uh, the feedback from our department heads, the feedback from our staff, and the feedback from um, not only the individuals that we selected for the interview process, but even some of the public that showed up this morning. And I think that was a really important element to my decision, and I think it probably was to, you know, was to yours. Anything else? Entertain a motion. Motion to approve. Hold on. 
can't really do that. <laughs> no. So this is a, a little more complicated. Yeah. So it would essentially be a motion to direct staff to enter into negotiations with Terrence Moore um, for a city manager contract. I'll make that motion, but I'd like some discussion after there's a second. Second. So will uh, you, Ms. Jellin, uh, be doing that? Mm. How are we going to be entering it? Um, last time it didn't go smoothly, and I'd like to ensure that that process goes much better this time. I, I, I'm very confident that this will go smoothly. We won't get into the past. Um, I did speak with our outside counsel, and I think it's best to have him negotiate the contract. Um, I meant to speak with Commissioner Boylston ahead of time, but um, he did recommend having just one member of the council as almost like a point person, um, just to almost go back and forth to see what would be, and this is to the general terms of the contract. I don't know if that's truly necessary, but I think it's, it's helpful Commissioner Boylston would not be in the negotiating room or anything like that, but if outside counsel needs assistance. I'd like to do that. <laughs> like, I'd like Ms. Jellin to do that. Well, I think she was talking about to somebody from the commission. Uh, I, I, that happened I, I can time. always call all work. five of you like I've done in the past, yeah. you know, and I'm happy to do that. But he did actually suggest Commissioner Boylston if he was interested and if the commission was interested. If not, I'm happy to be the liaison. I do think it is um, better to have our outside counsel. I know what the commission is looking for in the contract. Right. But I also feel that as far as negotiating goes, it's probably better than the person who's gonna be sitting right next to him. Who's the, which is the, which member? Mr. Monday? Schneider. I'm sorry, what was the name? Mr. Schneider. If you want me to do it, I'm happy to do it and just have him review the it. agreement. It's whatever the pleasure of the commission is. Most city attorneys typically don't do the actual negotiations. If you want me to do it, I'm, I'm which we've done it a couple times now, so, you know. I, I, that's, that's why I wanted our own city attorney. I mean, okay. you're... Mm -hmm. Agreed. Understood. So I will, I will handle it. Um, thank you for the vote of confidence. Um, and obviously, like I did last time, I'll reach out to all of you as we go through the process to ensure that everyone is acquainted with the terms and accepting of them as well. I, I think yeah. that's best. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so, you. so, Mayor and Commissioners, I would like to um, ask, would you like me to reach out to the candidates to at least l let them know where they are in the process? That's nor yes. normal procedures that we yes. do here at the city. Yes. yes okay. Sir. Thank we you. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Please call the roll. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Thank you. Right. Very good. Thank you very please much. Please thank all Jordan. the applicants again. Absolutely. I mean, this was a super really hard choice. Everybody was qualified and it was challenging. Thank you. Very good. Anything else? No. Nope. All right. Moving on to co uh, comments and inquiries on the agenda and non-agenda items from the public. And first off, the city manager's response to public, um, prior public comments. My only comment, Madam Mayor, is that I'm glad that we changed that agenda up because this is the first time I don't have to speak after Miss Lachey King. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> because it's very hard to follow hard up on all that spunk, I tell you what. So I don't have any other comments. Thank you, okay, Madam Mayor. Okay, very good. So what we're going to do is um, open it up to the public. Please make sure that you sign in uh, your name and um, address. And then when you come to the podium, please um, state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes to speak. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Ebony Crispin. I'm at 2707 Northeast 14th Street Causeway. I'm actually in Pompano Beach. I'm here on behalf of the organization I represent in Broward County. We have a healthcare center. The organization is AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Um, as a part of my role as a legislative affairs and community engagement manager, uh, we do a lot of community outreach, as you can imagine. Uh, one of those um, activities include um, a beautiful road that's been painted rainbow colors on behalf of Pride that is happening this month, as many people know. Um, and uh, my friend here, Jason King, who um, is a wonderful guy, I always like to give you a little shout out, King, I love him. Um, he uh, reached out to myself and the regional director here in Palm Beach, uh, Kristen Harrington, uh, and asked that we participate and be a part of um, this road um, painting. Uh, that's painted in rainbow color. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being um, an example to the community 
um, that not only to be inclusive and all that that means, um, but also even though it sometimes is a hard topic, topic as many people know, um, AIDS uh, were, was a, uh, it continues to be what certainly was a pandemic and an epidemic in its own right in the 80s and 90s. Um, we continue to fight that fight. And what, do it look, what does it look like to end the epidemic? And so our role in being celebratory, but also commemorating the lives that were lost, um, both now and um, over 30 years ago now. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for being a part of this um, partnership. Um, and we're grateful to be able to be um, one of the sponsors that made that happen, um, the road happen. Um, and also wanted to just give acknowledgement to Kristen Harrington, as we have a healthcare center here in Palm Beach. Um, in Delray, um, and so wanted to say hello and thank you so much for your work. Thank you so thank much you. for your comments. Sir. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Michael Gully, uh, 201 Southwest 11th Avenue. Uh, I'm the COO for the Achievement Centers for Children and Family. Uh, we've had a long-standing history here in the city of Delray Beach, uh, going back to 1969 when the organization started. Um, we've had a great partnership with the city over the years, stretching back to the mid-1980s uh, to 1990, with the city donating land for our first building, uh, which is right off of Lake Ida Road. If you've passed down Lake Ida, heading towards Swinton, you've passed the Achievement Centers. Uh, today, I've brought a group of our teens from our high school team program. Uh, we were able to expand our community-based footprint uh, with our high school teens with funding from the United Way of Palm Beach County and uh, the Youth Services Department of Palm Beach County. Uh, so uh, we're happy to be here today, happy to uh, have our teens in attendance to see the inner workings of city government. Uh, we were here with Janet Meeks earlier today uh, to get a behind the scenes tour of City Hall. Uh, this is the first opportunity for a lot of our, our kids to actually come to City Hall and it's great for them to be here today to see uh, city government at work and how important it is to be involved. Um, these teams are also a part of our employability skills program. As part of that program, um, we were able to uh, launch some Saturday programming for our, our teams. Um, there's not a lot out there for them to do, and we were able to open up our doors on Saturdays to provide a safe space for them to come. Uh, so we just want to thank the city for your continued partnership and um, invite any of you guys uh, to come out uh, to see what we do at Achievement Centers to in engage with our teams. Uh, they are wonderful, wonderful young people and I encourage you to really get to know them. Uh, they're awesome, they really are. In fact, we're actually hiring a few of our graduating seniors to join our team uh, at Achievement Centers for our summer camp program, so we're really excited about that. Uh, so thank you very much and uh, we'll enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much. Before, before he goes, what, what time on Saturday you said? Our, our programming runs from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Saturday. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome. It's great to see your faces here, and I'm so glad that you joined us today, and hopefully you learned a little something. Uh, great to have you here. Anyone else? Seeing no one. Coming up. Public comment is closed. Moving on to consent agenda. Second. To approve the consent agenda. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. All right. Moving on to regular agenda. In the regular agenda, we have 7A, which is ratification of emergency uh, related um, COVID act um, issues, which obviously is a surprise to all of us. <laughs> I think we're 63 and 64. There you go. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. And now we're moving on to resolution 97-21. I have to read this one into the record. Sure. Resolution number 97-21, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending its budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1st, 2020, by providing for supplemental appropriations in the amounts identified in Exhibit A, repealing all resolu resolutions inconsistent herewith, providing an effective date and for other purposes. Thank you, Mayor Commissioners. John Leggy, Finance Director. Uh, this next agenda is a uh, staff recommending approval or adoption of Resolution 9721, which will amend the fiscal year 21 budget. <coughs> Excuse me. This budget amendment does two things. It appropriates encumbrances outstanding at the end of the previous fiscal year, fiscal year 2020, which includes purchase orders for goods and services that were encumbered at 930 2020 
but where the goods and services were not received by the 9-30-2020 date. Until further, uh, it also for projects that were budgeted and started in the previous fiscal year, but were not completed, but will be completed in this current fiscal year. Secondly, this budget amendment in the general fund transfers $49,240 from the city manager's contingency fund in the general fund to cover a budget shortfall for the elections that were held in March. It's my understanding that because of uh, COVID, some of the polling places were changed and there had to be additional mailings, which caused the cost of the election to go up a little bit. Also, it will transfer $50,000 from the city manager's contingency fund to the insurance fund to pay for firefighters' cancer benefits. In 2019, the legislature passed a, uh, passed a law that firefighters have 21 different cancers that are presumpt presumptive that they have them. There's a $25,000 payment. This money will put money in the insurance fund to cover those. We don't have any of those right now, but those will be budgeted to cover those if they do occur. Uh, it also increases revenues and expenditures in the general fund by $15,322 to pay for the Wi-Fi extenders for the CRA uh, in accordance with the interlocal agreement with the CRA. It appropriates $3,840,000 from the general fund's fund balance to the Urban Development Action Grant, the UDAG grant, uh, for the projects that will be, uh, be moved forward with the UDAG grant. We talked about that at the budget uh, workshop on Friday. Uh, transfers $106,432 from the city manager's contingency fund to the general fund to pay for elevator repairs located at the Fetterspiel parking garage. I hope I get how to do that. Pretty good on that. <laughs> okay, great. And that's for the general fund. For the neighborhood services fund, it carries forward the revenues and expenditures in the neighborhood services fund of $2,781,419. These are for grants such as SHIP and CDBG carry forward into the next year. In the general construction fund, it increases revenues and expenditures in the amount of 190393 in the general construction fund for CA projects per the amended interlocal agreement that was passed a month ago. And it appropriates $60,000 from the cemetery fund balance for the perimeter fencing at the municipal cemetery. Uh, the balance in that cemetery fund, fund balance is about $1.433 million. This will appropriate $60 million for that. Again, staff's uh, recommending approval of Resolution 9721. Happy to answer any questions you may have. So my question is, is how come we don't have that up on the screen? Mm -hmm. we were having, we're listening to you and you're, you know, you're rattling off, but there's like, there's nothing for anybody to look at or, you know. Ma'am, this is my first budget amendment. That's yeah. typically, uh, I. Right, the, um, we put the screens up for any kind of PowerPoint presentations on items and we don't necessarily present every item with a PowerPoint presentation. I, I just kind of think this is pretty important, and um, this should be something that everybody can see. I mean, I appreciate that. It's, it's in the agenda, backup. Yeah. No, I understand that. that. I'm just saying that, you know, as we're going through, that would be, I think, an important thing to have up on the screen. I don't think that that's only for um, presentations. I think that we've used that many times for just this, to make sure that there is a list so that anybody who is in the audience that might want to. Mayor, I'll take that under, I'll take that, uh, my first budget amendment to the commission. I will certainly have that the next time I guarantee Perfect. You. I appreciate it. Anyone may, else? May, um, yep. In my um, looking at other cities, while I was researching uh, the city manager candidates and how they were doing the budgets, I was astonished. Uh, again, I have said this, and it's almost a broken record. Since I've been here, I have had a different process for each of the years, and none of them have been satisfactory. None of them have been consistent, and I have never had faith in any budget that I have voted on. And I was hoping this year that we would have begun some kind of um, meetings with the public saying this is where we are, uh, meetings with the commissioners, this is where we are. And I understand that we don't have a s normal city manager and the ICM has been really inundated with COVID matters and that might have been one of the reasons we didn't have something going on. But it would be so nice if the public were aware of what we are doing with their money. And I welcome you again, sir. Thank you. don't know what you've done in the previous uh, positions you've held in other cities, but it would be so nice if we involved our city and our city commissioners in our budget. 
Thank you. I think, I think we will um, as we go through the budget process um, because we do have that that budget interaction. I'm sorry. Our next our next city commission meeting is going to be our first public budget right. workshop, and then we have a second one scheduled, I believe, in August. August 24th. And then in September. That has yes. to be done prior to in order to be able to have everything that meets the budget um, necessity. So uh, we will have a lot of interaction Absolutely. With, yes. with, with the commission and also with the people. Yeah. So Vice, Vice Mayor Johnson, if I just jump in there, I, I, I feel you, um, obviously, <laughs> because we've had change in, in leadership. But I have been very confident in budgets that we passed. And last year was tough. And we were really conservative. And things are working out really well. So I, I, I think we have been su successful with that. Um, but that's why I brought up at our goal setting in regards to that calendar. No matter who is our city manager, um, you know, hopefully we got stability there starting tonight. Um, but that that calendar of public meetings before yes. the workshop and all that, that is just, that's the calendar, no matter what. That's, you know, that's the way we do. I really hope that we move forward with that where the second week of June is for our goal setting. And then, you know, two weeks before the first budget presentation, there's a public meeting. And it, and just that's it in Delray Beach. That's the calendar. It includes the two town hall meetings or you know whatever. So and I support I support you, uh, Commissioner Boylston, and that's what I'm saying. We have not had. I you've been up here longer than I have, and perhaps your experience has been much more than mine. But I would say from uh, budget year 17, 18, we've not had it. Mm -hmm. 18, 19, we didn't have it. Mm -hmm. 19, 20, we didn't have it. And of course, 2021. With COVID, I didn't expect that. I didn't expect anything. So I, I thank you for that. There are lots of things that we should have as a calendar event, so that the public. Oh, it's uh, July. We should start preparing for that budget meeting that they're going to have it to tell us what's going on. Absolutely. And young people, I hope that you're listening because we spend your money, we tax you rather, and we spend your money. You should know what we're doing. And once you become Voters, you're already residents, I hope. Once you become voters, it's very important that you keep track of the money. You got it. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, you think so? yeah, no, please, please. Super quick. This no, no. is just a, a question. It might be for you uh, versus Mr. Leggy, but the $3.8 million um, we're transferring from the general fund to the UDAG, we had that earmarked previously, and this is just a transfer? This, is, this money is sitting in unassigned fund balance, and okay. we're now appropriating the $3.8 million to be used for those purposes. So I have a curveball. Um, my question is about, and thank you very much for the presentation and the information which I did see and the backup. Um, for general fund number five, the 106,000 for the repairs to the garage. Here's my question, and I, actually it's for you, Lynn. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> this garage hasn't worked for how many years? Too many to count. Okay, so here's my, it's a defective item in my opinion. Shouldn't we go after the manufacturer or the installer or something there's got to be something out there because it, it hasn't worked at it's my yearly thing this in the trucks I think I bring up the most I, I would have to tell you deputy vice mayor um, can we start with no I know can we start with um, uh, um, city manager Alvarez because I, she explained to me what is going on and there is an explanation that all of a sudden for the very first time I in my history of being here um, recognize that there's something going on, and let her explain that to you, and then and then I think uh, you can follow up, <laughs> Lynn. Perhaps she can tell us how old the garage is, and I don't even know. Well, how it's, old it's it is. Not, that shouldn't have any effect on the uh, the. But let 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 her explain, and 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 then I think everybody it will make sense. Sure, I'm happy to. So I've been with the city for three and a half years, and I think the very first time I came to the office, the this garage, which I took me a while to to learn how to pronounce as well. Um, came up. Uh, so essentially, um, it had fallen into disres dis disrepair a number of years ago. I'm going to try to keep it a little bit short. Um, it fell into disrepair. We did have a contractor who was handling not only our monthly maintenance required for all of our citywide elevators, as well as repairs from time to time. Unbeknownst to us, essentially, um, what we have learned, and it's a little bit in hindsight because you can't actually catch it when it happens, um, that um, contractor was slowly building and trying to repair this elevator by installing what we call proprietary parts. 
And once those proprietary parts are on that elevator, you really don't have the ability to change those parts, touch those parts, kind of like an OEM manufacturer situation. So um, when it started, when we got a new contractor on board, they were able to identify finally the fact that what we need to do is take those proprietary parts out, put in non-proprietary parts so this can finally be addressed with the new contractor. And if ever in the future we need to continue to replace, rebuild, or even modernize it completely, I, I believe this 106 is for the complete overhaul modernization, correct? With non-proprietary parts, any contractor that is certified in this field can actually take care of it. So it's a long way to say we've finally gotten to the bottom of this and we feel like we have the appropriate solution moving forward. Um, I went ahead and authorized uh, Mr. Luggy to put this into the amendment because I know how important it is to our community to get this elevator fixed. I know the frustrations. It's just we are all very frustrated. Um, the second piece of that I think is where you might ask me next. So I'm going to go ahead and say um, I need to kind of continue the conversation with, with our city attorney to basically ascertain what our legal options may be to be able to somehow recover some of those funds that we paid that contractor. Um, we did actually have a dispute with that contractor in the past, probably about a year ago, that we were able to settle for a nominal, I shouldn't say nominal, but I think we settled for about 37000 at the end of the day. 28000 um, Sorry? 28000 Thank you. Okay, so about 28000 um, And now my concern is now that we've really gotten to the bottom of that post-settlement, what would be our legal options? And that's where I obviously will rely heavily on our city attorney because I do think that we should explore them. Amazing explanation. Thank you very much. I understand it now. Mm -hmm. I bet you can't wait to get back into purchasing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Was this also the same with the elevator at Old School Square? No, it's no, no, a no. better spiel. No, I'm saying First was it the now. same situation, Did you want to add? same <laughs> contractor? No, I mean, what Jen said is absolutely correct. I mean, we've learned a lot about elevators in the past couple of years. And so now we know not to get proprietary parts because that's where the issues arise. And when you have a contractor who's solely providing those, there's no other option. So we'll look into that contract, and then um, if there's something that we can do legally, um, we're happy to do it. So just, just out of curiosity, how is it that someone can make the decision to put proprietary parts in a public elevator that is owned by the city without us recognizing that because, again, that eliminates our ability to be able to get anybody else to fix it, and that makes their job completely secure. And now we're having to pull out those parts to put in new parts, you know, non-proprietary parts, in order to be able to get that thing going. So what is, what is the... What is the legal ramifications of somebody doing something like that? I'd have to look at the contract. I, candidly, I haven't looked at it recently, okay. but I know when we looked at it initially, um, it, it was it was something that they could do. So wow. I, it wasn't something that you know was contrary to the terms and conditions of the contract. But I'll look at it again, and if there's something that we can do. Um, I'm, I'm guessing we have your blessing. Well, yes, you do, and I hope that you're looking at other, um, you know, um, I, I'm sure that the city of Delray Beach didn't write up the contract and say, could you please put your proprietary parts in here? So it makes me wonder, how did that contract even come to be that we would accept? And I hope that in the future, if we're looking at any contracts, obviously we do not want to have anything like this happen again, because it's, it's been a very, very expensive and frustrating um, you know, process. I mean, for the last, as long as I've been up here, and I think uh, even even before me, uh, um, uh, the deputy vice mayor has has experienced this as well. And it's it's just it's so difficult. It's, it's unfortunate, and it shouldn't happen. You know, it it was a long term agreement. I do remember that, and it was there was a maintenance component as well as you know a separate contract to repair. So it was it was intertwined, and we really had to work through figure out what how did we get here. Um, and we'll just we'll take a look at it now that we have more information. Very good. Anything we're, else? We're about to do an extensive amount of building between now and whenever with our CIPs. I would hope that that contractor's name is nowhere on the list of uh, people you want to contract with. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No, no, I just look forward to being at the ribbon cutting. <laughs> <laughs> we we will have a ribbon elevator. Cutting. <laughs> <laughs> motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Um, okay, one other question I had about the UDAG funds. So how is that working again? Because I know I, I had asked this before, but where is that going? It's going into, we're going to be utilizing that? Oops, I'm sorry. We lose, Mr. Leggy? Mr. Walthour can help. Okay. 
Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the commission, Sam Walthour, Interim Director, Neighborhood and Community Services Department. <clears throat> the uh, UDAG funds, and I don't want to go too far into the history, but those dollars uh, that originated out of HUD, mm -hmm. we uh, are looking at utilizing them in the same strategies that have been approved in our exi existing CDBG program. So things like owner-occupied rehab and some of the other uh, uh, job retention, job creation type activities, those will be the activities and the strategies that we'll utilize uh, those that funding for. Are we going to see that, what you're going to be utilizing them for Absolutely. before you actually? Absolutely. And the we'll reason I ask is because we've been trying to find a, a, a way to use those funds, and I know they're very restrictive. Right. However, um, you know, with the housing situation, and I thought it had to do with structural. I, I don't know. There was something that kept us from, from <coughs> using them in the past, but I, I would love to see us use some of those funds for what we're trying to do now, which is to create, um, you know, uh, you know, affordable housing and, and whatnot. This is a, a tremendous... Uh, amount of money, you know, we've got uh, over th what is it, three million? Three point eight. Yeah, three point yes. eight million, and that was, um, you know, something that was not guaranteed, um, but uh, uh, was 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 gone after by the city, um, you know, uh, by a couple of uh, commissioners, and I, I, I could, you know, I could talk about who was involved and when whatnot, but I, I'm 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 going to be better than that. Um, so anyway, I, I think it's a very, very important um, uh, thing that we have that we can use for the betterment of our city, and I just want to make sure that it's not, it's noticeable how we do it. Absolutely, 100%. We will lay out a plan and make it clear, share with the manager's office to make sure that everybody's on, on board, board with us. Very good. Thank yes, you so much. Thank All you. right, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Okay. Moving on to, we don't have any public hearings. We don't have any first reads. So we're down to comments and inquiries. And it starts with city manager. And it looks like you have a, a an item. I do. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this should be v rather brief. Um, um, we do have a presentation on this. Um, I wanted to just have a conceptual conversation with the commission and find out the willingness and the desire for the commission to move forward on some of this artwork that has been proposed in our uh, Pineapple Groves, Groves District. Um, and I, we really just wanted to present to you the concept, get a little bit of feedback from the commission tonight. If you like the concept and you would like us to move forward, at that point we would then start talking more with our attorney to find out if we need to come up with some agreement for maintenance, location, ownership, things of that nature, insurance. So with that being said, we'd like to present you with the concept and then I'll just request a little bit of feedback. Great. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Commissioners. My name is Jason King. I'm the Legislative Affairs Manager. Um, and as the Interim City Manager just mentioned, this is a, a concept that's been in the works for a few years. Uh, we were alerted to it uh, through our interaction with the Pineapple Grove Arts District. We have uh, Jeff Wyman, the artist of the two sculptures, and uh, David Beal from the, from the Arts District today, in case you have any further questions that I can't answer. Um, I want to give a little background on the artist just briefly. Uh, Jeff Wyman is originally from St. Louis, Missouri. He started his career, uh, at his college career in Kansas City Art Institute and later was uh, transferred to the University of Miami where he earned his Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree in 1975. Uh, Jeff Wyman later received his Master of Fine Arts uh, from the University of California at Berkeley in 1981. Mr. Wyman has had numerous professional exhibitions uh, from San Francisco to New York to Miami, uh, most recently with a sponsored individual art exhibit at Art Basel uh, in, two, in 2019 and also at Boca Raton Museum during the years 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> Mr. Wyman has also had many public collections uh, in places such as the International Ceramics Museum in Xingdijin, China, the Beats IL Art Institute in Jerusalem, uh, the University of Miami, and the FIU Frost Museum in Miami. So here are some of the, uh, well, these are the two sculptures uh, for discussion this evening. This is Hope. And the locations were previously identified by Public Works uh, in collaboration with the artist uh, and uh, the Pineapple Grove Arts District some time ago. Uh, I took the time to work with the artist uh, Jeff Wyman and David Beal to identify the two locations that would be most uh, suitable, uh, in our minds anyway, for 
uh, for these sculptures. So we identified this location. Let me try to get the cursor here for Hope. So this is on Northeast. Both sculptures are going to be, uh, if, um, if at the will of the commission, placed on Northeast, 20, uh, Northeast 2nd Avenue. So this is Northeast 2nd Avenue between Northeast 1st Street and Northeast 2nd Street uh, near the uh, Hyatt Hotel. And this would be where Hope would be placed. So this is Hope, if you could try to imagine it, uh, at this location right here. And uh, this is just, we were doing some measuring to ensure that the spacing would be uh, adequate, and uh, we believe that it is. The next is Shy Dancer. Uh, I believe it's a little taller, correct, Jeff? Shy Dancer, a little taller? Oh, smaller, okay. So the other location that we identified that we thought would be suitable for Shy Dancer uh, is the location in front of the City Walk development at Northeast 2nd Avenue between Northeast 2nd Street and Northeast 3rd Street. So again, these were locations that were previously identified uh, by Public Works and the artist and uh, Mr. Beal. And again, we were measuring to ensure there should be enough space. Um, it was brought before the Public Art Advisory Board and they recommended approval uh, for both the locations uh, with respect to the respective sculptures. And so that is the item before you this evening for, for discussion. Um, we do have additional information if you have questions regarding the dimensions of the base of the sculptures. Uh, and also I, I wanna mention that the Pineapple Grove Arts District uh, is willing to fund the concrete pads onto which the sculptures need to be bolted. So they're willing to pay for that um, and assist with the installation as well. Can I ask a question? Um, it says indefinite period of time, and uh, I'm just curious about that. Obviously, if we're putting it here, when, when it's moved, we probably want to put something back. So who determines how long it's going to be there? Is there going to be proper notice so that we can then replace it with something attractive? You know, what is it for sale or is it just for display? Yeah, Commissioner Cassell, so those are some of the um, questions that we weren't able to answer at the time. Uh, that we brought the item for um, for review to the Public Art Advisory Board. That's why we in, we indicated indefinitely. Um, it would obviously be subject to whatever negotiations occur with uh, the artist, the Pineapple Grove Arts District, and the uh, and the city. Um, I would mention that there are a couple of options on the table. Uh, Mark Minkin is the purchaser of uh, of Hope, the Hope uh, the Hope piece. The developer, Mark Minkin. Um, and he's donating that to the Pineapple Grove Arts District. And also the Pineapple Grove Arts District, District was planning to, if it's not been done already, to purchase Shy Dancer from the artist. The options that are on the table are that the uh, Arts District would donate the items uh, with the um, agreement that the items remain in Pineapple Grove, preferably on 2nd Avenue. Uh, I think that's still something that could be negotiated, but that is their um, articulated preference. Um, in that if that were the case and the city were to take it on entirely then the city would have responsibility for maintenance liability and so forth uh, that that's what that's one option the other option uh, would be that they would be out on loan to the city um, and the the parameters under which that occurred would you know obviously be up for negotiation um, you know pending the city attorney's negotiation with the artist but maintenance would um, forgive me, but sure, um, just cleaning it maintenance. What, is your mic on? Microphone. Yeah, here you go. I'm sorry. What type of maintenance are we talking about? So it would yeah. primarily just be um, uh, avoiding rusting, corrosion, but but mostly it's just paint that would have to be um, reapplied every every so often, a couple of years. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What else? Yeah, I have. If the Public Art Board and the Pineapple Grove Arts District Board are both in favor of this, art is obviously subjective, and this is a great reason to have those two boards so they can make those <laughs> decisions and we can get behind them. So if they're in favor, I'm in favor. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, first of all, Jason, if you could sure. scroll to the place where the gentlemen are standing on our pavers or at our pavers for Shy Dancer. Mm -hmm. We have spent an enormous amount of money, I would presume, in order to have those pavers put there. I don't know if we're discussing, first of all, if there's something, some forethought was given. I wasn't there at their meetings. Was that taken into consideration that if it doesn't become permanent there, um, it's just something that I don't think we're discussing. 
And I think I heard um, ICM Alvarez said, say something about insurance. Does that mean the city is taking on insurance because of this sculpture? That would ultimately depend on how we structure the agreement. Um, so if we were to take ownership of it, then it would be part of our city inventory, and at that point we would insure it under our general liability. Um, but that's not necessarily the only way that we could do that, depending on how we come up with the final contract. But that's why this is just our absolute kickoff discussion with the, the commission. There hasn't really been any further. That's why we wanted to understand conceptually if you like this and we'd like to move forward, and then we will start figuring out some of those um, details with our city attorney and the Pineapple Grove Arts District to iron out what works best for the city. Okay. Yes, and, and Vice Mayor, uh, if I might, I just wanted to um, point your attention to, it, it does, the recommendation from the art board, um, they understood would, uh, would be, you know, be pending the determined location by the Public Works Department. So they're gonna be, um, in lockstep with with this plan we're not we're not going to be um, doing anything outside of what their recommendations or, or uh, preferences would be but these were locations that were identified by public by public works um, with consideration of the pavers once again i think we're having a discussion under comments now the commissioners are not allowed to do that so i i guess our motion isn't to be that we're going to put this on an agenda that item there's not a motion it's we, would, we don't need a motion we would is. just need to the so feedback all we're doing is listening to comments and giving me a green light to proceed if that's the will of the commission consensus okay and what i'll be doing then is circling back with city staff the city attorney and the arts group uh, so nothing's going to happen until we absolutely not we would always bring back for final consideration to the commission the agreement and and the locations and all of the detail the I would like to definitely discuss the cost to Absolutely. the city because uh, this isn't a work that's made of iron. iron? Uh, is iron? it steel, Jeff? Steel? Yeah. It's steel. Heavy he has to come to the mic. Jeff, it, yeah. Hello. Hello. State your name for the record. Oh, hi, I'm Jeff Wyman. I have the Wyman studio down on 3rd and 3rd. Yes, it's Hello, Mayor, hello, Commissioners. I'm happy to answer any questions about public art, public art installation. Uh, I've done this a few times over the last 50 years, so fire away. No, we, we weren't. We just uh, wanted to know what the, 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 um, the makeup was. The yeah, so the pieces are, are fabricated with welded steel, and then um, they're welded arc welded with welded steel there uh, the shapes and forms in the steel are pretty thick so there's a really longevity to the work you know 100 years or more and they're um, cleaned and uh, finished with um, a primer an enamel steel primer and then two coats of paint the pieces are Pretty much uh, been refinished in the last few weeks, but there'll be there'll the option to put one final coat on after they're installed, so that there won't be any maintenance uh, in terms of rust or problems. You know, probably every three years, someone should keep someone should walk over and take a look and see if there's any little spots. And you can keep somewhere where you keep your cans of paint, a 50, like 50 gallon, a 50, 50 a gallon. $50 gallon of paint, you know, handy. And um, if I'm still around, you can, I'm certainly happy to touch it up. And although they did put my building up for sale this week, so after 13 years, so that's not so good. But anyway, um, uh, they will be bolted down to concrete pads. And that's a good question that you asked about the pavers on, for the one piece. So in my experience, what I, I don't know who's in charge of putting the pavers in for the city, uh, but um, the big piece, of course, there's, it's just ready for concrete. And we put the five or six inch pad in, and it's reinforced, and the piece is placed. Um, and then it's bolted with four inch heavy steel bolts, so it's not going to go anywhere. The other piece, uh, the pad can be put on top of the pavers. And bolted down through or we can remove just the the amount of pavers you're talking about 32 by 40 inches worth of pavers so like that 
So if you ever wanted to move the sculpture, you would just have to replace, you know, replace probably a dozen or so pavers. Uh, I don't know what those costs are, but um, it, uh, it's not that complicated. And uh, I've agreed with uh, David, who is president of the Pineapple Grove Arts Commission, to um, to oversee the installation and to uh, oversee and work with the concrete pads specified and uh, at, at their cost. Well, there's no cost to the city. There's, at this point, there's zero cost to the city for anything to enjoy these pieces. Um, Mr. Minkin is making a nice donation and um, the other pieces being acquired. Uh, the only thing uh, we would need is when they're ready to be moved from my studio to the sites, which is four blocks away, three blocks away, the use of some kind of uh, equipment that you might have on hand, a forklift or something, um, if that's possible. So Mr. Wyman, I have a question for you. Have you, uh, in any of the placements of any of your um, um, artwork, um, had any um, incidents, somebody hurting themselves or anything? Because this Thank is- Thank God, no. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a, 18-foot sculpture that's been out in front of the Boca Raton Museum, the old one, which is now the Boca Raton School, uh, but it's still part of the museum um, since 1992. Um, I'm thinking about just like Florida. Mm -hmm. There's uh, another big piece that is at the Philip Frost and Patricia Frost Museum at FIU campus that's been there since 91, about a 10-foot piece at their entrance, and that's a campus with, you know, thousands of and there's been no incidents. Um, and thank God there's been no incidents of graffiti, mm -hmm. which is uh, very nice to know that people don't want to spray paint and you know, deface your, your work, like, not like some mural artists have had those problems in the past. You know. Right, um, um, I'm, I'm just asking that because it's in a pedestrian right away, and yeah. my concern is, is it's, it's, it's steel. Um, you know, somebody, I don't know how sharp your edges are. I presume that they're not. Yeah. Um, so, but that would be something that would be of concern to me, just yeah. to make sure that we have um, that covered with respect to um, anything that could happen that could injure somebody, and then we're kind of being sued. Yes, sir. Mr. Wyman? Yes, sir. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your generosity. Yeah. I have an uncle who has made a living uh, as a uh, artist. He's a glass blower. Where, where at? Uh, his name's Leon Applebaum. He's been all over. He's he's in some of the galleries in, on Atlantic Avenue. But I know how uh, labor intensive and difficult your business is, particularly in the last year or so with the pandemic. So the generosity for these pieces, and I know the piece you're talking about on Palmetto Park Road, that huge sculpture yeah, where the, the old blue museum used to be. Yeah, yeah. So uh, as someone who grew up with, uh, with a grandmother who was an artist, an uncle who was an artist, um, I'm no expert in art. I, I like to look at it, but it's very kind of you to uh, uh, want to donate something to our arts district because uh, uh, rapidly it's becoming the Pineapple Grove other uh, things other than art district. Right. So for you to bring that back, that's very right. kind of you. If so I remember you. correctly, can I make a comment? Sure. If I remember, uh, I don't know if it still is the the one of the goals of the city of Delray Beach was to become like an international art mecca, you know, to have the arts and culture and theater and music and whatnot. And I don't know if, if any of you attended, um, uh, I gave a lecture in front of Old School Square Cornell Museum about five years ago about public art and uh, in America, contemporary public art. And um, how the three acres around there, I was hoping to work with people then to to construct a little urban sculpture garden. And they had, of course, a big budget of three or four million dollars to put the pavers and benches and things that would need to be done. And I still think that Delray could really, the whole city, at least, you know, from the highway down or wherever, could be a really nice, like in Seattle or in Oakland, where they've taken a couple of uh, 30 or 40 block area and they've made a nice little urban sculpture park and it's made a made it into a destination for people internationally. And um, there's so many great sites and so many great uh, locations for that that um, I still think that'd be a wonderful thing for, for Delray Beach. 
appreciate that. Yes, yeah, I just, yes. I just want to make thank you, sir, for thank your you for your much. art. I, I, but um, before he leaves, I'm, I'd like to um, agree with the mayor. I would be very concerned about anything that's of this type of um, material being placed in a pedestrian type um, location. I love the idea of something, statutes, etc., in front of a museum or some other place, but I'm very well, age, I guess. You want to say Children, I, adults, people run into things, they walk into things, they're not paying attention. I'm just very concerned about this type of art being. I can, I can tell you that. May I, sir? Okay. I think um, it's very nice that we could be displaying a local artist's Absolutely. art in our city. I agree. And I feel like we can make some arrangement where we can discuss the ramifications and the insurance options during the negotiations because I'm in favor of having your art displayed. Um, and I love it. I see it on third. Yeah. And um, it's very sad that you're having to move yeah. your location. You know, it's interesting. I've been here 13 years with probably there's a dozen large scale sculptures sitting right there on the intersection. Mm -hmm. Talk about public, you know, people walking up and down. Uh, a third, and I've never had any incidents. What's, even what in size? So I wasn't able to determine, and the presentation might have said it, but I couldn't, I didn't hear what size are these. So called? the Shy Dancer is about my size, maybe about six feet tall. It's not really too big. And Hope is about uh, nine feet tall. But the, uh, but the locations actually where they're going to be bolted down, they aren't in the walkways. They're in the little kind of square areas between some trees and bushes kind of like so that you're walking by and it's to the left or you're driving by and it's to the right. You'd have to intentionally walk up to the piece. Off, Injure yourself, off right. The walkway, you know, and you can do that with a sign too, you know. You no, can, no, no, I'm just saying yeah. Yeah. it would and be intentional is what you're saying. Someone would have to purposely have done that to injure so, themselves. So what I would do is uh, any time in the next couple of weeks or so, if anybody wants to just drive by, I don't have to be there, these are all, so you can visit the studio and walk up to the pieces and look at them and rub them and pat them on the back and <laughs> feel them and, and you know. Might just they're not, do that. They're, they're all about joy and celebration of life, the work, so it's. I love the colors. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, thank Mr. You, Wyman. Sir. Okay, anything else? That's all I have, I think all right, I have my I think direction. you got your direction, thank absolutely. You. So moving on, is there anything else that you have on the agenda? No, okay, no more comments, city attorney? Nothing. I, I was able to text Mr. Moore, and he wanted to, you to know that he's very grateful and excited for the opportunity. So I, my goal is to have um, the agreement for your consideration at the July 6th agenda. Fantastic. All right. So, and does he have, um, I didn't ask, uh, is there a time frame that he has to give notice? No? We didn't don't discuss think it. He's in, didn't discuss is he employed right now? I don't think oh, he is. Okay. All right. Very good. I just, I wasn't aware. I just called, he said, kept employed. saying he would have that one year renewal every year. Right. He's presently unemployed. Oh. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, moving on to the commission. Anyone else? Anyone want to start? Um, yeah, I'll get There I am with the microphone again. I'll, I'll keep it short. Thank you for for coming. And uh, and actually, you guys picked a really great meeting to come to. I and mean, <laughs> it's not every day that you pick a city manager. And this won't happen again for a very long time. Right, we guys? Pray. Um, you know what? I, I Someone mentioned... Um, at one point in, in Delray Beach, we've heard of the decade of excellence. And I'm not exactly sure everything that happened in that decade of excellence or when exactly that was, but I have a really good feeling about the next decade uh, here in Delray Beach after Thursday and Friday, putting up all, all of our, our plans together and the, you know, the time I've spent with staff, not only um, in regards to the goal setting, but in regards to this new hire that we made today and um, I, I really, I really, I have a really good feeling about these last few days with uh, with you guys and with our city staff. And I think we might be kicking off our own uh, decade of excellence. So, um, and it's been a tough week. We've all we've all been here a lot. We have another Thursday CRA workshops. And we're working a lot, but I'm really looking forward to ending this. You know, two weeks of a lot of time together um, with the the Pride Crosswalk, and I just the energy and the excitement. Is, uh, is really great. I think it's gonna be a good way to cap off this week together. So I look forward to seeing you guys. Well, I'm gonna see you many times before Saturday, but I look forward to seeing you uh, Saturday morning out there for that. Very good, thank you. Yes, thank you. It has been a long two weeks 
and we're still, we still have Thursday, and then I still have uh, League of Cities. So all I can say is I thank all of you for your um, input. I think we learned a lot at our goal setting. <clears throat> I think we learned that it matters who we choose as our leader because things happen when we're not sitting up here. We say something, we uh, put out a policy, we put out a direction, and we later found, find out that's not what's being done. So let's uh, maybe work on how we can make that not be the way things are. And I agree with you, Commissioner Boylston, that hopefully this will be a decade of ex excellence and beyond. So I thank you one and all. I thank um, our city manager, RCM, rather, uh, Jennifer Alvarez, you've been great. You've helped us through quite a storm. COVID was not easy, and you didn't call me at 9 o'clock to ask me what I thought about what you should do, and for that I thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our uh, city attorney, uh, Lynn Jellen. You have been wonderful in giving me advice about things I should think and do and not say and think and do. So um, thank my fellow commissioners. Mayor, I thank you. I thank Mr. DeAndre and uh, Dot Bass for every effort that they put into making this as easy as possible for us. Young people, I can tell you the hardest thing, if you ever desire to be up here, and I sat where you sat, I won't tell you how long ago, except on a one-on-one -on -one when I come and see you on Saturday, I'll tell you when I sat in those very chairs and said, oh, I'd like to be up there because they look like they are important people. They're making the decisions for the city. Well, those decisions weigh heavily on you. So think twice for, before you make those grand desires because if you say it, it will happen. So I thank everyone and uh, with that, good night. That's what you call a giveth and a taketh away. <laughs> just think twice, just think twice. Do Absolutely. it, but think twice. Yeah, it's gotta be part of your heart. On to the side, anybody? Sure, I just was going to uh, use my comments time to recognize the return of the voice of reason. It's been oh, yes. many months Mr. Long. since he's been here. <laughs> uh, I was disappointed you had no public comments, but I'm sure you'll have some uh, very, very soon, so it's very nice to see you, sir. Absolutely. You. Very good, Commissioner Casale. I have no comments, except I think this is a very exciting day. I look forward to moving forward, and thank you all for coming. And I'm going to end with just saying that I am. I was so pleased um, at uh, how well everything um, turned out with respect to our um, looking forward or looking for a uh, new city manager. I think it went off without a hitch. Uh, I think that it could have gone in a very <laughs> different direction. And this, this is Del Rey, um, but I, I really was proud um, to um, be with everybody here, and I think everybody handled um, all the matters um, great. I wanted to make mention, and I also wanted to say thank you very much for uh, those that applied. Um, that was amazing to have such a great group of um, applicants for uh, revying for, to be the city manager of Delray Beach, and, uh, and we appreciate um, the, their coming out and, and, and applying for our city to be our city manager leader. Um, I wanted to also mention that on Friday, just a reminder to my colleagues, if anybody is going to be serving at the uh, Spirit Barbecue, I just want to make sure that everybody remembers that because that's that's where we actually get to serve our um, our employees. They're always serving us, so this is our opportunity to be able to um, serve them. So uh, remember your times and, and show up with a smile. And then also that we have on Saturday, as was mentioned, pride the pride uh, um, ribbon cutting for the beautiful, um, and that turned out magnificent. It, it is just amazing. Um, we have striped our, our, our street with the pride colors. And um, so we're going to be doing a ribbon cutting there. And we also have a chili cook-off happening in town. Um, that's over at the um, Big Apple Shopping, Shopping Bazaar, um, also on Saturday. So if anybody wants to head out there, that would be fun. And I just wanted to bid a, um, and I know we're going to be seeing each other again on Thursday. It is a busy week for us. But a reminder that after this Thursday, you all have a nice break until um, Tuesday, July 6th. And that's what we did in planning and organizing our, um, our uh, you know, uh, breaks. And we all have another nice break also in the month of uh, July to August, which is great. So I just want to bid everyone a, a happy time uh, away from each other and, uh, and then uh, coming back together in July. Uh, after the 4th of July, so I'm wishing you all a happy 4th of July as well. So if nothing else, I'm going to gavel the meeting. Me meeting adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>